So ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> We're going to talk in this first session about Russia, Ukraine, ISIS, very real problem, isn't it, for our world at the moment, ISIS, and the future of the Middle East. So, I want to start with a prophecy of the Old Testament, the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 38. And this is how the alternate translations, the literal translations of the Bible, translate the words that we read in the King James that say in Ezekiel 38 verse 1 and 2, and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, the more literal translations actually recognise the fact that there's a name here that doesn't appear in the King James Version. So Rotherham, for example, says, Son of man, set thy face against Gog of the land of Magog. So that's the land of his origin. He's prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. Well, the King James hides this name, Rosh. It's very important to understand that that is there uh, in the original Hebrew text as a proper name. The Amplified Bible supports that. Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, of Meshech and Tubal. We want to talk a bit about those names. Rosh, Jesenius, the recognised uh, Hebrew lexicographer, says in his lexicon that this is a proper name of a northern nation mentioned with Tubal and Meshach, undoubtedly the Russians. Now many have tried to debunk that. The more they try, the more they prove that in actual fact Rosh is the ancient name of the nation that we know today as Russia. So here we've got the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. Undoubtedly the Russians who are mentioned by Byzantine writers of the 10th century under the name Rus, dwelling to the north of Taurus and described by this uh, Arab writer of the same age as dwelling on the river Ra or Volga. So where is this river Volga? Well, there it is there. And so the Rosh he's talking about are people who settled in this area. Now, you have, you'll, you'll note immediately that this is the area of Ukraine. We want to talk about the importance of what's happening in relation to U the Ukraine uh, right now in relation to Bible prophecy. Meshech is up here around Moscow, and Tubal, of course, is the area of Siberia and to the east. There is a city up there called Tobolsky. It comes from the word Tubal. So here are the peoples referred to in Ezekiel 38 and verse 2. Now, if you had any doubts as to where they are actually in relation to the land of Israel, well, you only have to look at verse 15 of Ezekiel 38, and it says this, And thou, Gog, shall come from thy place out of the north parts. And then actually is rendered literally by other translations, like the RV, out of the uttermost parts of the north. Well, north of where? Well, the Bible, of course, is focused upon the land of Israel. And if you draw a line from the land of Israel due north, you almost cut Moscow in half. So there's no question about what is meant here. The powers referred to are the powers to the north of Israel, to the far north of Israel. It's the area that we know today as Russia. So Gog is of the land of Magog, Prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal. So who is this Gog that's referred to here? Well, Unger in his Bible dictionary, written 150 odd years ago, said this. Ezekiel 38 and 39, which deal with Gog, the prince, he recognises the fact that this is a dictator. In actual fact, the name Gog in the Hebrew language means a roof or the one at the top. That comes from the English and Hebrew Bible students' concordance. So here is a controlling power, like an umbrella power. It's a dictator. It's a reference to a man who is a dictator, who has a system that is dictatorial. And he extends his power and control over other peoples, as we're going to see. Well, I'm going to suggest to you that there might be such a dictator already uh, ruling the country of Russia. We'll come to that a little later on. Now, when you go to Moscow and you drive around, you see many government vehicles, and you see uh, license plates like this. This is a government vehicle. You see here these words, R-U-S. That's the Rus. That's the Russians. That's the Rosh of Ezekiel 38 and verse 2. Now, we know that this prophecy of Ezekiel 38 is actually a latter-day prophecy, and I'll show that to you in a minute from verse 8 and onwards. So it's a latter-day prophecy. It's about this power that we see today, Looming, large in the earth, isn't it? Russia. A huge problem for our world under Vladimir Putin. 
Well, this prophecy goes on to talk about how this power, this dictator Gog, is going to put together a vast confederacy of nations. And they're referred to, in part, in verses 5 to 7 of Ezekiel 38. There's Persia. Now, the Persia here is not Iran of today. It's the Persia of Ezekiel's time. This is 600 years before Christ. If you have a look at a map, at a map of the time of uh, Ezekiel, the prophet, Persia was a much bigger territory. It, it went from Syria right across to Pakistan of today. So it's talking about a huge territory. I'm going to come to that point a little later on. Ethiopia here is actually modern Sudan, portion of, of modern Ethiopia. It's mainly modern Sudan. And Libya, of course, we're aware of what's happened in Libya with the overthrow of Colonel Gaddafi and the problems that are occurring in that country now. And they will lead ultimately to Libya being absorbed into this huge confederacy of nations that Gog will put together. So what does he do? It says, these countries with them, all of them with shield and helmet, which of course is the language of military uh, hardware. Goma. Well, who's this Goma? Well, Goma refers to the Galatians or Gauls who migrated west from what we would call Turkey in that area today over to what we would call Western Europe, to France, and Holland and Belgium and those sorts of countries. So here we've got the Western European nations who are embraced in this massive confederacy. There's also the house of Togomar of the North Quarters. Now, there was a people once called the Tokamazi. They're called the Armenians today. Some of that area of Togomar is also in southern Georgia. I don't need to remind you that when the Olympic Games were going on in Beijing in 2008, that Vladimir Putin sent his troops across the border into the northern sections of Georgia. Yeah, it's just another country he's ultimately going to embrace in this huge confederacy. He's going to have eastern Turkey, what we would call Turkmenistan or Kurdistan, um, Armenia and southern Georgia. Goes on to say this, he's of the north quarters, which means it's north of Israel, that's where Armenia happens to be, he, many people with thee. And then it says to go, be thou prepared, which is what he's doing now, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Now this word guard in the Hebrew language in which it was originally written means a guard of a prison. Jesenia says it means a custodian. In other words, this, this dictator will not take no for an answer. When he locks onto a nation, like he has done, of course, with portions of Ukraine, he's not going to let go. He's going to take custody. He's going to lock him up in a prison. So all of these powers that are enumerated here are going to become part of a confederacy and he will lock them into it and they will not be able to escape. That's what this is telling us, ladies and gentlemen. It's very, very clear as to what's going to happen in the future. So I want to just step back for a second and have a quick review of what Ezekiel 38 requires prophetically. We've just talked about this dictator dominating the Eurasian continent. We've just talked about verses 5 and 6, the territory east and north of Israel coming under his control. A dependent Europe falls under God's political control. That's verse 6. Now, something we haven't mentioned thus far is verse 8. I'm going to read you verse 8 of Ezekiel 38. It says this. After many days, thou, talking to Gog, shall be visited in the latter years. So it's telling us when this prophecy is going to be fulfilled. In the latter years. We are in the latter days. It goes on to say this. And thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword. Now this proves it's the latter days. Because it goes on to say this. And is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. Now Ezekiel wrote this prophecy under the hand of God in 600 BC, circa, approximately. The nation called Israel had gone into captivity 120 years before when the Assyrians took them away into captivity. So they hadn't been around for 100 years when Ezekiel wrote. There has not been a nation on earth since 722 BC until 1948 called Israel. So this is a latter day prophecy. It's the time when the nation of Israel would be restored after millennia of dispersion. They're brought back from the sword, it says. And what have they done? Well, look at verse 8. It says, which have been always waste, but is brought, back, brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely 
or securely all of them. Well, you see, that part of the verse hasn't been fulfilled because Israel doesn't yet dwell in the kind of safety that this prophecy is talking about. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> the Bible wrote yesterday's headlines. It wrote the headlines about 1948 when Israel became a nation state. It wrote those headlines. It's in the process of writing tomorrow's headlines, as we're going to see. Now, what about this statement I've made here, West Bank part of Israel proper? Well, you see, the world today is in all sorts of confusion about the future of the Palestinians. Netanyahu's building settlements and more houses on the, on the West Bank. He's causing problems with his relationships with America and the European nations, etc. All right, that's a big problem. You know, and even Israel says, well, yes, we don't mind having a Palestinian state providing it's totally demilitarised so they can't cause any trouble. The Bible tells us exactly what is going to happen. It says here that when God comes down, he comes down upon the mountains of Israel. I ask you a question. Have you ever looked at a geographical map of the land of Israel? Where are the mountains of Israel? Well, the highest point in the land, apart from Mount Hermon in the north, is 3,300 feet at Hebron. And the mountains run from just south of Hebron, which happens to be in the West Bank, by the way, right up to Gilboa, which happens to be the north border of the West Bank. 90% of the mountains of Israel are in what's called the West Bank. This prophecy is telling us that it will never, ever become a Palestinian state. It will never be called Palestine. Because you see, God comes down upon the mountains of Israel. It'll become part of Israel proper. Now, that's how you should interpret Bible prophecy, ladies and gentlemen. You don't interpret on what you see, you interpret on what the Bible says, and it will come to pass as surely as the sun will rise tomorrow. And we're going to do a bit of that in the course of this next uh, couple of sessions. Israel will be at peace internally and with the near names. We read the end of verse 8. And verse 11 tells us exactly the same thing. It says of Gog, thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely. All of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Well, there was a huge 35-foot wall surrounding the West Bank, around the green line today. It's got to come down. And it will come down when Israel takes control, complete control, and embraces the West Bank area. If there is a Palestinian state, and the Bible hints that there will be some kind of community that related to the ancient Philistines, it'll be down where the Philistines once were. It'll be in the Gaza Strip. But it will be at peace with Israel, because before what the Bible calls Armageddon, the great battle of the, of the great day of God Almighty, before the battle of Armageddon, ladies and gentlemen, Israel must be at peace internally and with the nations around it. It must be in total peace. They're not in peace today. They have Hamas with many rockets. Hamas, of course, is on the back foot now. But Hezbollah, Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, has got 26,000 rockets that can reach the Negev. So clearly, that's a huge problem for them. They've got Iran producing nuclear weapons, and Israel's talking about the need to smash that. They're not at peace today. But before Armageddon, they will be. And that's, of course, where we want to take you here this afternoon. Israel also will be very prosperous, we are told in verse 12 of Ezekiel 38, when these events occur. And Britain will be allied with its former colonies in opposition to this Gogian dictator. We are told that in verse 13. And will be supported by the Arabian Peninsula states, with whom, of course, Britain has had a long history of cooperation. So that's just a brief summary of what Ezekiel 38 requires. And of course it's all designed to produce this end result. So here we have this massive, you can see in the colours of the red, you have the massive confederacy from the four points of the compass, from down here, Libya, Sudan, over here, the, the Persia of Ezekiel 38, the countries to the, to the north, the countries of Europe, they come down ultimately upon the mountains of Israel and that's where that, that great confederacy will meet its end. It will be destroyed on the mountains of Israel. But against them will come another confederacy of peoples, these peoples here, the, the Tarshish powers of Ezekiel 38, verse 13. And Armageddon will occur. Armageddon will be a battle that will be fought, initiated in the land of Israel, but will have huge consequences for the whole world. So that's where Ezekiel 38 takes us. 
and I think maybe this man might take the world there. We'll have to wait and see whether he's actually the Gog of Ezekiel 38. But he's got all the characteristics and he's certainly created the Gogian style dictatorship required by Bible prophecy. His name, of course, is Vladimir Putin. He's come out of nowhere. Come out of nowhere, this man. Who would have ever thought that this lowly colonel in the KGB would become the most powerful and indeed the wealthiest man in the world? He's said to own something like 55 to 57 billion dollars. You know, he makes some of these American bigwigs look pretty small. So he is huge in the scheme of things. And you've had a bit of a feel as to the way he operates. Well, the Bible actually talks about that. I want to go to the prophecy of Habakkuk chapter 2. Now, it's in what's called the Minor Prophets, which I think is a misnomer, because it has a major, major uh, prophecy to offer to us in relation to this man. So, what about the dictator? Well... Habakkuk 2 is all about a dictator. It's all about the Chaldean dictator in the times of the prophet Habakkuk who was to bring God's judgments upon his own people because of their waywardness and unrighteousness. But you see, this was also prophetic of future events. And I want to prove that to you, that we are actually in a chapter dealing with events that have to do with our time and the re-establishment of the kingdom of God. Now, you just read with me firstly... Verses 5 and 6. I'm only just going to take for the time being just the last half of verse 5, if you don't mind. We could read the lot, but just take the last portion of verse 5 and the last portion of verse 6. Maybe the whole of verse 6. So the end of verse 5 says, But he gathereth unto him, this is the dictator, all nations, and heapeth unto him all peoples. Shall not all these take up a parable against him, and a taunting proverb against him, and say, Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his? How long? And to him that ladeth himself with thick clay. Well, the thick clay here is not a real great translation of the original Hebrew. It actually means in the Hebrew, pledges of allegiance. Pledges of allegiance. Now, that's what this dictator was going to do. He was going to lock people up, lock nations up, and hold them in a bind by getting them to pledge allegiance to him. I think there may be a man sitting in the Kremlin who operates like that right now. He's certainly doing that with Ukraine, as you're going to see. He's getting pledges of cooperation. He's going to do that with all of Europe in due course. In fact, he's going to put together that massive confederacy that we've been talking about. He's going to do it by the policies, the approach of this particular dictator that is referred to here in history. So, where are we? Well, have a look at the context of Habakkuk 2. It speaks of an appointed time. It's obvious what that is. It will surely come. It's divine intervention in the earth, which we expect pretty soon. It speaks of the faithful having a short destiny. The just shall live by faith in verse 4. It speaks in verse 14 of a time when the earth should be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. Is that a fact today? Of course not. In, in verse 20 it says, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. It's followed by chapter 3, which is a psalm detailing the march of the rainbow angel of Revelation chapter 10. It's all about Christ's military campaigns to establish the kingdom of God. What context are we in? Latter day. Clearly latter day context. So therefore we should look at this prophecy and say, well, what was the character of the dictator referred to here? Because it's telling us something about the character of the latter day dictator, the goat of Ezekiel 38, who will come down upon the land of Israel. Well, his character is spilled out. In verse 4, he's a corrupt Chaldean oppressor. In verse 5, he's noted for drunkenness, pride, expansionism, insatiability, and dictatorship. In verse 6, he uses coercion and blackmail. They're his favourite devices to, to, to bring his control upon other nations. In verse 8, he's ruthless in spoiling nations, cities, and innocent people. You might be aware that when Vladimir Putin became the Prime Minister of Russia in 1998 that one of his first acts was to have the KGB blow up two apartment buildings. Yeah, they found it. It was the KGB. It wasn't the Chechens at all. He had the KGB blow up two apartment buildings, so he had an excuse to attack Chechnya. 500,000 people were butchered. The cities of Grozny and others were just decimated. He, that's the kind of character he is. Absolutely ruthless. He uses religion to hide and to justify his actions. I want to talk a bit more about that in a minute. Verse 12, he builds his empire by fire and blood. 
In verse 15, he uses base practices to undermine others. If I had the time, I could tell you the story of how he became president of Russia. It was because he protected Boris Yeltsin from an investigation in 1999. All right? And Yeltsin was in debt to Putin. I won't do that now, but ask me later and we'll talk about the details of that. In verses 18 and 19, he uses, he's a religious image worshipper. Well, you think, well, hang on. Could that be Putin? Yes, it is Putin. Putin, the devoted Christian. All right? When he was inaugurated in 2000, he kissed what was called the image of the icon of the Madonna of Vladimir, which I find very interesting. The Madonna of Vladimir. He presented one of these to Pope Francis I in November 2013 and kissed it in his presence. This man here, Kirill, is the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church. Nobody can rule Russia today unless they're in bed with the Russian Orthodox Church. When Kirill became patriarch in 2004, you know what he said? He wanted to make the Russian Orthodox Church a Putin church. It is a Putin church. So here is a man who uses religion to cover. He, by his own admission, is a street-fighting thug. And he's shown that, hasn't he? By his own admission, he's a thug. And yet he uses religion to hide his real character and to promote his purposes. There's even a Putin cult in Russia. Radio Free Europe reports this, this gentleman here, this Russian, radical Russian Orthodox activist Dmitry Soronov, on the 7th of September this year in a lecture, he said this, God is inside Vladimir Putin. A divine light transfixed Putin's essence after his secret baptism as a child. We are not worthy of the Russian president, he said who, by the way, can be in power legally. He doesn't need to use legal means, but he can be legally in power until 2024. Mm. Providing he's got good health, do you think he's going to give the job up? Do you think he's going to retire? No. Why would you when you own Gazprom and its money, its profits are going into your bank account? Why would you? So I think we may have our man. Doesn't bother me if it's not him. Because there will be a Gogian dictator just like that, but I think he's ideal for the job and time will tell. Well, what's the meaning of the name Vladimir? Well, it's used across a number of countries in Eurasia. It means to rule with greatness. It's derived from the Slavic element volod, to rule combined with mer, great or famous. The second element has also been associated with mer, meaning peace or world. This was the name of the 11th century Grand Prince of Kiev. Anybody know where Kiev is? I'll talk about that in a minute. That's the capital of the Ukraine. That's where the Rus began. That's why Putin is going to take control of the Ukraine. Talk a bit more about that in a minute. So you see, he actually models himself on people of the past. He sees himself as a czar. Now I ask you this question. Who do you think might have made these statements recently? Today, many nations are revising their moral values and ethical norms, eroding ethnic traditions and differences between peoples and cultures. Society is now required to accept without question the equality of good and evil, strange as it seems, concepts that are opposite in meaning. Many Euro-Atlantic countries have moved away from their roots, including Christian values. Policies are being pursued that place on the same level a multi-child family and a same-sex partnership a faith in God, and a belief in Satan. This is the path to degradation. Well, I think, he, you know, whoever said this has probably summarised Western civilization pretty well, haven't they? Who do you think made those statements? Vladimir Putin. You see, he's stolen the moral high ground. He's now presenting himself as the man who represents the true religion. The only thing that can be right, because you see, the rest of the Western world has gone off into the ether and they're calling good evil and evil good. All sorts of things that are completely and diametrically opposed to the Bible now dominate their society. But I, Vladimir Putin, am upholding the values of Christian society. Let's have a cut too. He uses religion to cover his true character. The brute that he is. Well, he said that in the, nation, the State of the Nation speech, which your president, of course, makes in January every year. 
in December 2013. Well, what about Ukraine? Remember this map that we put up recently? The land of Magog is that area encircled there by red. Gog of the land of Magog, Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. Ukraine. Ukraine is part of the land of Magog. And Vladimir Putin is determined to make it the centrepiece of a Russian empire. Why? Why would he do that? Well, people try to explain this. Andrew Wilson, who wrote Ukraine's Orange Revolution, said, a real democracy in Ukraine is an existential threat to the entire system that Vladimir Putin has built since 2000. The first man to become president of the Ukraine, independent from Russia, was this gentleman, Leonard Kravchuk. He said this recently in 2014. Russia, understanding that without Ukraine it would not be able to take its place in the wider arena of Europe and create a new, powerful structure that could counter counterbalance the United States and others, and this is Russia's goal, made the strategic decision to keep Ukraine in its embrace. Now, we have been watching things about this, haven't we? We watched this year the Crimea. They have fought battle after battle in history over the Crimea. It took Putin two days. Two days, and he had it. Now, why was, why was the Crimean Peninsula so important to Putin? Well, it's actually the heart of Russia's Mediterranean fleet. All of its mili military, naval operations in the Mediterranean are based in Sevastopol on the Crimean, pen Crimean Peninsula. That's where the headquarters, the command post of Russia's Mediterranean fleet is. So he had a dilemma. You see, Russia has built two ports in Syria, one at Latakia in the north and the other one, all with Russian money, at Tartus in the south. They had 50,000 Russians in Syria to support those two ports. He's had to pull most of them out. He doesn't want to lose them. Because, you see, these two ports in Syria were actually controlled by the command base in Sevastopol. Now, they were, they were renting, you know, they were hiring the, the naval base at Sevastopol from the Ukrainians, and the Ukrainians are going to join the European Union. This was going to jeopardise Russian command control of their navy in the Mediterranean. It was not going to happen. So what did he do? He sent in men who couldn't be identified as Russian troops. They took it over. And within a couple of days, it was all over by the shouting. And there's been a bit of shouting since, hasn't there? But who's done anything about it? Nobody. He's going to do that with the rest of the Ukraine when the circumstances are right. It was strategically linked to Syria and to their Mediterranean Navy. That's why Sevastopol and the Crimean Peninsula, Peninsula is now Russia, part of Russia. He's trying to build a land bridge, by the way, on the eastern corridor of Ukraine, so they don't have to worry about you know, getting there the long way around. So here are the two ports, Latakia and, and Tartus, down here, that are Russian seaports. They've got 11 new, brand new ships that operate out of these two ports. Why do you think that's the case? Well, you see, when the Gogian Confederacy comes down upon the land of Israel, this prophecy is going to be fulfilled. And the king of the north, I'm going to talk about that phrase in a minute, shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen with many ships. Yeah, many ships. They've got many ships in the Black Sea. They've got many ships just to the north of the land of Israel. So there, we believe, the Bible is actually writing today's headlines. Leave alone tomorrow's headlines. It's actually writing those headlines. The Ukraine is integral to Russia. The Rus first established Kiev as the capital of the land of the Rus. They did that way back in 989 uh, uh, AD. In 2004, Ukraine elected a democratic European-inclined president, Viktor Yushchenko. He was poisoned prior to the election. He ended up you know, with all these pock marks in his face. Uh, Putin's ally, Yanukovych, of course, has just been evicted from Ukraine, was defeated and Putin was humiliated. I can actually show you a photograph of his face when the result of the election came out. I have never seen a man so humiliated with such a vengeful look on his face. Well, he got his vengeance. 15 months later, he retaliated. On the 1st of January 2006, in the middle of the coldest winter they'd experienced in the Ukraine for, for decades, he just turned the gas off. And they froze. 
And then he said, well, we can solve this. I can put the gas back on. But you will put Yanukovych into the prime ministership and you will just be a figurehead president, Mr. Yushchenko. And that's what happened. What's that, do you think? Well, that's coercion. That's blackmail. Isn't that Habakkuk chapter 2? Yeah. That's the character of this man. He offered, of course, $15 billion to Yanukovych to solve their bankruptcy problems. But that's off the table now because, of course, he doesn't have the political control that he's seeking in the Ukraine. You see, this was the place where the Russians began their history. Now, listen to this. 19th of March this year, just days after the so-called election. of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin. such a gentle fellow, doesn't he? He wouldn't harm a fly. Good afternoon, members of the Federation Council and the State Duma. Distinguished representatives of the Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol. Citizens of Russia, the residents of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol. Now, there wouldn't be a Putin cult in Russia, would there? I mean, he's, he hasn't even started, and he's getting a standing ovation. He's pretty happy about it, too, I'd say. Friends, today we've gathered to talk about a very important issue, a historical issue for all of us. On the 17th of March, Crimea saw a referendum that took place in line with the democratic procedures and international law. More than 82% of the voters took part in the referendum. More than 96% voted in favor of rejoining Russia. These are very telling figures. To understand why this choice was made, we need to take a glimpse into the history of Crimea. We need to understand the value of Russia to Crimea and the importance of Crimea to Russia. Everything is uh, related to Russian history. You have the Hersoness, where the ancient knights, uh, the ancient prince of Vladimir, was uh, baptized. He later adopted Christianity, which laid the foundation, which unites the nations of uh, Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. Does anyone doubt that Putin aims to take the whole of Ukraine? You see, you cannot have a Russian empire without its heartland, where it all began. The Rus first settled in the Ukraine. That was their land, the land of the Rus. Kiev was the first capital of Russia. So you see, that's why he's going to get the Ukraine. There's all sorts of toings and froings going on at the moment. It's all in vain. Putin will have control of the Ukraine in due course. We can't say when, but we can say with certainty that it will happen. Now, Ukraine was once part of the Polish Empire. There was a time in history when Ukraine was absorbed by Poland. Poland was trying to influence the European Union to draw the Ukraine into the EU as a buffer against Russia, obviously, to protect itself. Well, earlier this year, March, March the 24th, the Polish Prime Minister, Donald Tusk is his name, called up 7,000 Polish workers who were scattered throughout Europe. They'd received a call up 
to train as reservists for the Polish army because he expects Russia to take them next. Expects that Russia, once it's got Ukraine, will take aim at Poland. That's why he called him up. He said, called a press conference to warn that the world stands on the brink of conflict, the consequences of which are not foreseen. Not everyone in Europe is aware of the situation. He's aware of it. The Bible, which we've just been considering, Ezekiel 38, says they've got reason to worry. Because those Western European countries and the, the, the countries that uh, were once part of Russia are going to become part of Russia again, and so will Western Europe and become part of that great confederacy of peoples. Now, that's all I want to say, as time's moving on, so what I want to say about Russia for the time being, except their relationship with ISIS. <clears throat> I want to move on to this ISIS threat. ISIS is actually threatening Putin, which is not a great thing to do, I would have thought. So this article, reported on the 3rd of September this year, said, Russian leaders are seeking to cut access to an ISIS video on the internet, <clears throat> plans to liberate uh, the, the, uh, via the caliphate Chechnya, so the ISIS crowd want to liberate Chechnya. Oh, that's interesting. Calls for the, Ch the Chechen leader, Kadyrov, a Putin, a Putin puppet. Vladimir Putin was directly and personally threatened by the extremist Islamic terror group ISIS because of his close ties to the Syrian leader Bashar al-Assad. ISIS claims to liberate Chechnya and the Caucasus. Well, that sounds like a threat to me, to Putin. The Russian President Vladimir Putin discussed with his Security Council on Monday potentially contributing to fighting ISIS, according to Russian news agencies. The United States has been trying to build a broad coalition to thwart ISIS militants in Syria and Iraq, but Russia has not been part of the conversation. Now, this was an official in their foreign ministry. He said this, The anti-ISIL coalition is not a club party. We do not expect any invitations, and we are not going to buy entry tickets. In other words, Russia is saying, we're going to act against ISIS because they're threatening us. They're threatening our southern borders, but we're not going to join you, Mr. Obama. We will, we will have, we'll be free agents. Well, ISIS could potentially threaten Moscow, says this NBC News report on the 23rd of September. Potentially threaten Moscow directly? The group's ranks include Muslims from Russia's North Caucasus region who have been waging their own insurgency in the mountainous region following two wars between Moscow and the separatists in Chechnya. So ISIS is a problem for Vladimir Putin. But he has an answer. You see, back in 2004... Five nations form what's called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO. It consists of China, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Now, these last three, of course, were once part of the Soviet Union. They're separate countries, but they, you know, they're allied with, with, um, with Moscow. Now, the green countries here, that's Mongolia, uh, this is India, Pakistan and uh, this is um, um, Iran and Iraq, etc. These countries are observer nations. They're potential members. You know, you know why they formed the SCO? They formed it for the protection of national borders. That's why it was formed. So if ISIS is threatening Chechnya and even threatening Moscow, he will simply call in his mates and say, well, I think we have a reasonable excuse to deal with this crowd. Putin is not going to allow a Muslim insurgency in the Muslim states that form the underbelly of Russia. That is not going to happen. If he lets it happen, he's an idiot. And he's no idiot. He will deal with ISIS in due course. I want to show you how he's going to deal with ISIS. And I'm going to use the Bible to do it. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7, this is what we read. This is about the fourth beast of Daniel's prophecy in that chapter. It represents the Roman Empire. Everybody agrees with that. Generally accepted, it represents the Roman Empire. And iron. It had great iron teeth. Right? Iron is the symbol for the empire of Rome of old. Now this prophecy talks about the history of the Roman Empire. It says it was strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces. All of that was true. But this part of the prophecy you can see in green has never been fulfilled. 
and it stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse from all the beasts that preceded it, and it had ten horns. Ten horns because the Roman Empire was actually broken up by barbarian invasions, and ten barbarian peoples established their own little kingdoms on what used to be the territory of the Roman Empire. That's why it has ten horns. Okay, got that? Well, it's very important to understand what the residue is. It's also important to understand this. That this fourth beast, in verse 11 of Daniel 7, is the one that Christ destroys at his return. He destroys this beast. Now, you can't destroy something that's not there. So this is telling us that the Roman Empire has to be rebuilt, reformed. Well, who might do that, do you think? Well, I think it might be the Gog of Ezekiel 38 that puts together what used to be parts of the Roman Empire into a great confederacy? Yeah, clearly. So, what's the residue? He stamps the residue with the feet of it. Now, that doesn't sound like gentle treatment to me, mm -hmm. stamping something with your feet. Sounds like military warfare to me, doesn't it? Well, let's consider what's the residue here. Let's have a look at the four world empires that Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 2 talk about. Well, there was the first one. It was formed by Nimrod way back in 2240 BC. And, of course, it reached its height in the times of Nebuchadnezzar, the great king that's referred to in the Bible. It was followed in turn from 539 to 334 BC by the Persian, the Medo-Persian Empire. Huge by comparison with the previous one. That was consumed by the leopard power of Daniel chapter 7. That was Alexander the Great who took this territory from over here in Macedon, which is where he came from, right over here to the Indus River in Pakistan of today. Massive territory. It was broken up, of course, into four parts when he died prematurely, uh, 32 years and eight months, in Babylon. Broken up eventually by his four generals. I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a moment. What about the Roman Empire? Well, the Roman Empire was huge too, but most of it was over in the West. The furthest that the Romans got was the head of the Persian Gulf, under Trajan. His successor, Hadrian, decided that it was too hard to fight these Parthians over here, so he pulled the border of the Roman Empire back to a line, north and south, that runs through modern Jordan and Syria. I've been to the forts they built, every Roman mile, stood in it. This became the boundary of the Roman Empire for the rest of its history, for the next 200 or 300 years. So what do you reckon the residue might be? Seeing that each of these empires consumed the one before, consumed the territory of the one before, what do you reckon the residue might be? Well, the territories of the previous empires of Medo-Persia and Babylon, of course, and of Greece that the Romans never conquered in their history. They never conquered it. That area you see there, bound in, bound in red, it's the residue. Now, did you recall what I said about Ezekiel 38? Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya, that Persia is not Iran of today. It's a much bigger territory. Syria, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, yeah. Because you see, that was once part of the Medo-Persian Empire, once part of Alexander's Empire. Rome never took it. But when the fourth beast comes into existence again, guess what's going to happen? It's going to stamp the residue with the feet. Gog is going to be the one that arranges that, clearly. Ezekiel 38 tells us that. So here we have that portion. You know, all of the trouble, all of the American lies and the Australian lies and the British lies that have been lost in the battles in Iraq, go back to the Gulf War of 92, go back to George Bush's invasion in 2003-04, go back to Afghanistan. How many people have been brought home in body bags? What's all that leading to? This outcome. The Bible is writing tomorrow's headlines. It's telling us that all that effort... All that money, which has bankrupted America, by the way, was all in vain. Because the Bible has always said, from Daniel's time, it's always said that that entire region is going to become part of the Gogian Confederacy, the Russian Empire, which Christ is going to destroy 
at Armageddon and beyond. All of that effort and money, if only they just read their Bibles, could have saved them a lot of trouble, couldn't it? Well, you see, we could give you a third proof, but I considered it to be a little bit too complex. You need a little bit too much background for a talk of this nature in order to understand it. But I'm happy to sit down with you and talk to you about it. There's another third proof that what I've just said to you is actually going to happen. It's Daniel 11, verse 40. Daniel 11, 40 talks about this area here as being the territory of the king of the north. And to be called the king of the north, you have to be a foreign occupying power of the Seleucid territory. Now, Seleucus was one of the generals of Alexander. He took possession of that area you can see in green. Alexander's empire was broken up into four parts. There were two dominant parts. King of the north and Egypt, king of the south. And Daniel chapter 11 is all about the history of these two powers using the land of Israel as their battleground, basically. Trompling on God's land through two or three hundred years of history. All right? I'm not going to go into all of the details of that, but that too is another prophecy that tells us that before God can make its invasion of the Middle East, before it takes possession of Constantinople, it has to become the king of the north. It has to take this territory. Because it says in Daniel 11.40, and the king of the north shall come against him. And I can demonstrate that the him there is the power ruling from what we call Istanbul today. It used to be called Constantinople. It's the Turks. So before Go can take Constantinople, which of course the Russian Orthodox Church has wanted to take for centuries, because that's where their religion came from, it has to take this territory here. And when God's got that, takes Constantinople, then they can fulfil Ezekiel 38 and Daniel chapter 11. This is 40 to 45. Come down upon the mountains of Israel, sweep into Egypt, and ultimately come back, be drawn back for the land of Israel to be destroyed in the Battle of Armageddon. And that's the story. Plunging down, driving down with many ships, remember? coming down the coastal plain, as, as Daniel chapter 11 graphically describes. Graphically describes it. The Egyptians are given in the hand of a cruel lord. The tidings from the east and the north, it says, draw the bulk of the, of the Russian army back in the land of Israel, and there they meet their, their end, at the hand of Christ. Ezekiel 38, verses 20 to 23. And the following verses of Ezekiel 38 say this. This is God talking about the end of this power that comes down upon his land, he says, and I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains. Yeah, the mountains of Israel, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. Goes on to say this in verse 22, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord. That's going to be the end of that great battle. It's all about the establishment, or as Shannon correctly said in his prayer, the re-establishment of the kingdom of God on the earth. This will be the outcome. Joel chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion, and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. Some really serious things coming, ladies and gentlemen. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling inside my holy mountain. Yes, there will be a house of prayer for all nations around an exalted Mount Zion. And people will come to it. And then shall Jerusalem be holy and there shall be no stranger pass through her any more. Great things are in store for our world. Wonderful things. But they will come on the back of the bitterest period in human history. Tribulation like the world has never known. I want to talk a bit about that in our next session, God willing. I want to talk also about the relationship of Russia and Israel, and I'm going to involve America's relationship with Israel too in that. So, you know, we're going to have a look at, how, at what the Bible says about tomorrow's headlines in relationship to Russia Israel and America, and briefly, Britain and Australia, by the way, as well. We might be down under, ladies and gentlemen, but we're not totally insignificant in terms of Bible prophecy, as you're going to see. So we're going to have our break now, because, you see, this is the end.
where it will all lead. They shall not hurt nor destroy. In all my holy mountain, says Isaiah 11, verses 9 to 10, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, and we know who that is. David was the son of Jesse, all right? And Christ came from the line of David. There shall be a root of Jesse, the Lord Jesus Christ, which shall stand for an ensign of the peoples, and to it the Gentiles shall seek. And his rest shall be glorious. 